It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote for today, who is Neil McBride. Neil is the general counsel of the Department of Treasury. He is the chief legal officer of the department, and he advises the secretary on issues including domestic finance, terrorism finance, financial crimes enforcement, international economic affairs, and tax policy. He supervises over 2,000 attorneys in the department. And before holding that very illustrious position, Neil worked with Davis Polk in DC, and before that, he served the government for 15 years, including as Associate Attorney General in the Obama-Biden administration, as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, as an AUSA in the District of Columbia, and frankly, that's not all, but I kind of thought you'd rather hear from him than me. So, with that, I will give you Neil McBride. to 
uh, understand the risk of sanctions, to build uh, compliance programs um, into their business models and, and their technology, sort of from the ground up and, and from the early stages. Uh, and three, to work effectively to identify, report, and ultimately freeze out uh, bad actors that are relying on um, the US financial system and other touch points uh, to, uh, to carry out malicious activity. Uh, where we see companies uh, failing to heed these lessons and, and therefore failing to, to um, restrain uh, malicious actors in the, in the financial system or otherwise, uh, Treasury, as, as I think is well known, you know, does not hesitate uh, to act, as some of our recent enforcement actions highlight, and we'll talk about those in a second. And again, as you heard yesterday from the panels in the afternoon, unlike uh, the Justice Department and, and, and criminal authorities, which are obviously of great interest to, to this conference and to each of you, OFAC authorities are strict liability, and the no mens rea is, is required for OFAC to find a violation of, of the sanctions. At the same time, OFAC is guided by its economic sanctions enforcement guidelines in determining an appropriate response to an apparent or alleged sanctions violation. And as those guidelines, uh, which are on the Treasury website, make clear, there are three mitigating factors that OFAC considers in, in, um, uh, in, in deciding whether an enforcement response is appropriate. Number one, a company's implementation of a risk-based sanctions compliance program. Number two, voluntary self-disclosure to OFAC. And number three, remedial measures taken in response to unearthing a, a, a possible sanctions violation. Um, so in, in promoting compliance through uh, guidance and, and industry engagement, it's, it's Treasury's so hope that companies will be able to prevent conduct that warrants an enforcement action. Uh, by the same token, we want to work hard to make sure enforcement actions help educate uh, industry and their counsel by both reflecting Treasury's priorities and communicate sort of lessons learned in um, published enforcement releases uh, that, that follow enforcement actions uh, so that companies are in a position to, uh, you know, to avoid similar uh, missteps in the future. So let me start by highlighting just a couple of recent OFAC settlement agreements. Uh, first, the, uh, the Sojit case from a few months ago involved a situation where rogue employees uh, conspired to violate their parent company's controls in brokering the sale of Iranian petrochemicals. And that particular case, as you can find on the OFAC website, really highlights the importance of ensuring that a company's controls uh, extend to their foreign subsidiaries and are robust enough to detect and prevent the circumvention of, of rogue insiders. Similarly, uh, there was a related case involving two U.S. Uh, mining companies, the Newmont Corporation and the Chizu International Corporation. One a large, sophisticated company, the other smaller and less so, but, but in, that, uh, in that, that joint action, uh, those companies were involved in the purchasing of, of Cuban origin explosive materials for foreign mining projects. And if you dig into that case, you'll, you'll see the importance of instituting uh, global controls and training employees both domestically and abroad in the sanctions tripwires to be, to be mindful of. Another case, the whole whole Holdings Limited matter, uh, involving an Australian logistics company, so not a, a, a U.S. company, but uh, Toll Holdings settled for apparent violations of five different sanctions programs uh, involving North Korea, Iran, and Syria. Those violations originated from uh, the sending or receiving of payments through the U.S. financial system involving these, these sanctioned jurisdictions or sanctioned individuals. And in addition to reminding global companies of the need to ensure that their compliance programs cover the range of risks they face, 
uh, including when those companies are, are in rapid expansion. Uh, the case also highlights uh, what a company uh, did right, and, and which was reflected in the ultimate settlement, uh, including a, an extensive internal investigation, a review of the alleged violations, and undertaking robust remedial action to prevent its recurrence. This forum obviously is, is, is not the place to get into the specifics of, of enforcement actions, but uh, we encourage counsel and, and interested companies to, to spend some time on the OPEC uh, website to dig into some of the, the granular details of, of these and other past apparent sanctions uh, violations. It's also worth noting that, that in addition to granting significant mitigation to companies that voluntarily self-disclose apparent violations to OPEC. Uh, OPEC is continuing to pursue proactive cases. And uh, in addition to a new law enforcement coordinator that sits at OPEC, Treasury continues to strengthen its ties with our interagency partners, including law enforcement, to identify and pursue potential violations. In addition, the Undersecretary for Terrorism, Finance, Intelligence, my friend Brian Nelson, uh, continues to amplify Treasury's focus on enforcement, has for the first time appointed a counselor in the, in the front office who's responsible for the development, coordination, and implementation of a TFI-wide integrated enforcement strategy and to advise on the development of enforcement-specific tools to uh, complement the targeting and enforcement of, of sanctions. And this new counselor position is going to work closely not only with OFAC, but with FinCEN, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, on an integrated approach to, uh, to enforcement. Uh, more broadly, in addition to the enforcement guidelines I mentioned uh, uh, a moment ago, I, I, I encourage all organizations and council to continue to look at OFAC's 2019 framework for OFAC compliance commitments. As a, as a basic guidance for risk-based uh, sanctions compliance programs. Uh, finally, OFAC is, is maintaining a broad focus across industry sectors. And while uh, traditionally many enforcement actions involve the financial uh, sector, uh, OFAC has um, in, in, in recent years looked beyond the uh, traditional financial sector to industries such as manufacturing, shipping, aviation, and other non-financial companies. And OFAC will continue to address violations uh, even by non-US companies, uh, particularly where those foreign persons or, or uh, companies rely on US persons or US, uh, US financial system to provide goods and services to, to sanctioned uh, entities. Let me shift to the second topic, which is uh, Russia's, um, the Russian sanction enforcement uh, program. Uh, and, and Treasury has uh, worked closely since February of 2022 with other US agencies um, and our foreign partners and allies to implement and enforce uh, severe sanctions uh, against the Russian Federation and its enablers, proxies, and elites. And since February, uh, since February 22nd to be exact, the start of uh, Russia's full-scale invasion, uh, Treasury, U.S. Treasury has, has really played a leading role within the, the U.S. government in imposing on Russia an array of sanctions that's been uh, unprecedented in volume and speed. Kara alluded to this yesterday. But sort of by the numbers, there have been approximately 1,250 new and 750 amended listings of persons on OFAC's special designation list and its block persons list. Uh, four separate executive orders by the president, uh, three new and one amended sanctions directives, five sectoral sanctions identifications, uh, 59 new and 28 general, uh, amended general licenses, and about 120 new and 100 amended uh, FAQs or the frequently asked questions that council and and industry look to, to um, for guidance from, from OFAC. So those are sort of uh, the numbers of, of, of OFAC's um, activity in this space, but in, in terms of 
how that is translated uh, concretely, the U.S. and its, its allies have, have placed, um, through sanctions and export controls, um, on the Russian defense industry, which has significantly weakened their military and their ability to make up for battlefield uh, losses. And as a result of uh, actions by the United States and, and 30 um, other countries, there's been unprecedented pressure on Russia's economy, which, according to one report, has resulted in the loss of, of, of nearly 30 years worth of foreign investment in, in Russia. So let me mention uh, a specific Treasury enforcement action uh, that took place just a couple months ago that, that arose out of this broad um, Russia sanctions effort. So in late June of this year, OFAC announced it issued a notification of blocked property to Heritage Trust. Heritage Trust is a, is a Delaware-based trust um, in which uh, OFAC designated Russian oligarch Suleiman Karamov owns a property interest. Now, at the time of this action in June, the Heritage Trust held assets valued at over $1 billion. Uh, the, the June enforcement action ensures that these, these assets remain blocked and accessible to Mr. Karamov. Heritage Trust was formed in, in June of 2017, so a number of years before uh, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. It was formed uh, for the purpose of holding and managing Karamov's U.S.-based assets. Karamov, as you may know, is a member of the Federation Council of the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation and was added to the SDN list in April of 2018 uh, for being an official of, of the government uh, of Russia Federation. Karamov has uh, retained a property interest in Heritage Trust following his designation, which results in Heritage Trust now being blocked. Additionally, Karamov's nephew, Ruslan Gadabev, is a member of uh, the State Duma. Uh, and, and the nephew was designated in March of this year uh, for having been a leader, official, senior executive officer, or member of the Board of uh, Directors of the Government of the Russian Federation. Gadiev is, is uh, also a beneficiary of the Heritage Trust, and his continued property interest in the trust provides a separate and independent basis for blocking uh, Heritage Trust. Now, this action in June followed an extensive enforcement investigation into Karamov's holdings by OFAC. These efforts revealed that Karamov had used a complex series of, of legal structures and front persons to obscure his interest uh, in the Heritage Trust. Uh, the funds of which first entered the U.S. financial system through two foreign Karamov-controlled entities prior to the imposition of sanctions against him. Uh, the funds once they reached the U.S. were subsequently invested in large uh, public U.S. companies and, and, and large private U.S. companies, and they were managed by a series of U.S. investment firms and facilitators. And Karamov uh, used, uh, and his proxies used various layers of U.S. and non-U.S. shell companies to hold formal title to the assets and to conduct transactions with the, uh, the billions in a manner which, which concealed his, his interest. So what does this mean? As a result of, of OFAC's notification of black property that was formally communicated to Heritage Trust uh, in, in June of this year, uh, Heritage Trust is now subject to the same prohibitions applicable to uh, Karamov. And all transactions by US persons uh, or US uh, financial uh, companies uh, within the U.S. or transiting the U.S. Uh, that involve the property or interests um, in, in Heritage Trust uh, are now prohibited. You know, absence of exemption or, or, or license from, uh, from OFAC. And these prohibitions uh, include the making of any contribution or provision of funds or services uh, for the benefit of Karabov or his, uh, his nephew. Just a, 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 a small tangible example of, of how the sanctions levied against the Russian Federation and its elites uh, operate uh, sort of in, in, in real time uh, in, in the United States and, and abroad. As my boss, Secretary Yellen, 
stated at the time uh, of Treasury's announcement in June. Uh, you know, even as, as, as Russian elites hide behind proxies and, and complex legal uh, arrangements, Treasury is going to use its, its broad enforcement authorities as well as its uh, part international partnerships to uh, to actually implement, uh, implement uh, uh, targeted sanctions uh, against the Russian Federation and, and elites. That's a segue to the, the third and final thing I was going to mention, the, the repo task force. Uh, John was mentioned this yesterday, the, the Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs task force, known as the repo uh, task force. It was set up in March uh, 2020 by Treasury, um, other elements of the U.S. government, as well as the G7, Australia, and the European Commission. And the repo task force has uh, really leveraged extensive multilateral uh, cooperation and coordination globally to do several things, to, to block or freeze more than $30 billion worth of, of sanctioned Russian assets, to freeze or seize sanctioned persons, um, oligarchs and, and, and otherwise, and to, and to very heavily restrict sanctioned Russians' access to the international financial system. And repo members uh, globally have, have achieved, achieved these successes through really unprecedented uh, collaboration and, and coordinate, coordination across, across the globe. In the first 100 days, um, after finance, justice, uh, home affairs, trade ministers, and European commissioners uh, announced the launching of this task force, uh, repo members, including the US, have, have um, I've done several things. I mentioned block or froze more than 30 billion worth of sanctioned Russians' uh, assets and financial accounts <coughs> and economic resources around the globe. And mobilized about 300 billion worth of Russian central bank assets. Uh, seized, froze, or detained yachts and other vessels owned or, or held or controlled by, by sanctioned Russian uh, individuals. Seized or froze luxury real estate. Uh, owned or held or controlled by, by sanctioned Russians, and restricted uh, Russians' access to global the global financial system, making it much more difficult for Russia to procure the technology necessary to sustain its, its unjust war in, in Ukraine. Uh, where appropriate and possible, repo members are also undertaking efforts to update or expand um, uh, their respective legal frameworks to enable the, not just the freezing, but the, the seizing or forfeiture or disposal of, of, of assets, as uh, Andrew Giles uh, mentioned yesterday. Uh, and these efforts will, will better uh, position members to achieve repos uh, uh, collective and global objectives. The Repo Task Force is also working collaboratively with the private sector to promote effective sanctions implementation. And financial institutions and, and, and other entities uh, that are required to comply not only with sanctions but with, with any money laundering requirements or, or, or counting, uh, countering of uh, financial terrorism um, are, are um, all tools being used to, to target uh, Russia's effort to, to evade uh, sanctions. And where available, repo members have relied on the use of registries bank account or, or beneficial ownership registries. I think there was reference yesterday to uh, a new rule Treasury published last week regarding the beneficial ownership uh, requirements. Uh, of course, repo's work is, is not uh, uh, complete. It will uh, continue in the coming months as, as uh, member countries continue to track Russian sanctioned assets and prevent sanctioned um, Russian individuals from, from undermining the measures that we have have jointly uh, imposed. And, and together, it's, it's the, um, the, the will of, of, of repo members and, 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 and other countries to uh, continue to use sanctions to impose costs on Russia for its attack uh, in, in Ukraine and to provide them of funds and resources need to um, uh, be used for the, for the benefit of, of sanctions. And of course, as we undertake this 
uh, work at the Treasury. We're working closely with our uh, fellow agencies, in, in, not only in the US, but our, our multilateral partners to maximize the impact of sanctions on designated persons or entities while guarding against spillover effects on uh, global commodities, markets, or uh, food supplies. So um, we are at time. Seems like a good time for me to sit down. But thank you for the chance to, to join this morning and to, to hit these, these um, three topics um, regarding our general core approach to enforcement of Russia sanctions more specifically in our participation in Rebo. And um, look forward to visiting you all.